Welcome to AI, Government and the Future, a podcast by Corner Alliance. We explore the intersection of artificial intelligence, government and the future with your host, Alan Pence. We work with government to create results. We ignite your agency's mission by helping you to design and implement high impact and innovative federal programs in AI, broadband, cybersecurity, public safety, and more. Being a government ally is at the core of all we do. Introducing your host, Alan Pence. All right, welcome this week. I uh, got a solo episode today. There have been some super important uh, developments in the AI front. Uh, I think it has a lot of implications for our government. And so I just want to take some time to go through it. So I've been reading recently a piece from uh, Leopold Aschenbrenner. So he was um, it's one of these super annoying kids who's like incredibly smart and he looks like Leonardo DiCaprio too. So it's kind of annoying. But he graduated from Columbia at 19 and he was working on super alignment at OpenAI. And that means, you know, helping make sure that AI doesn't uh, align to human outcomes that we want um, so it doesn't kill us. Right. But uh, super smart guy. And uh, he recently left to start an investment fund um, focused on AI. And he just posted a I thought it was a fascinating series of posts, almost like a like a book on his blog for our posterity.com. Definitely recommend you go check it out. Um, it's called situational-awareness.ai. And so it's basically a 165-page PDF, but it's linked so you can read it as separate blog posts. And really what I think he's pointing out, which I think we've got to get pretty serious about, a couple of things. One is, I mean, certainly the the challenge um, with China, the, the competition with China is going to drive a lot of what we need to do in AI. And I think what we've seen over many years is this, you know, when Silicon Valley began back in the 50s and 60s, it was really funded by the Pentagon to help, you know, produce semiconductors so we could do weapons targeting and jet targeting, you know, that kind of stuff. That was the early customer and funder that helped build companies like Intel um, and their predecessors. And then the Valley kind of grew over time and became, you know, I, I think over, you know, from the 70s, 80s, 90s into the 2000s, there really was a split in, you know, defense technology and consumer technology, right? And you know, obviously the internet was invented not by Al Gore, but by the uh, DARPA, ARPA, net, uh, ARPA is a defense department program. So obviously defense paid for the beginnings of the internet and that that ended up being a very customer facing, customer, you know, consumer facing product. Um, so, the, so the link wasn't totally, it wasn't totally delinked, but I think, you know, they're definitely in the valley Um, There was a sense for many years that, you know, working with Defense Department, working with governments on these kind of military side, you know, or or military and intelligence kind of roles was somehow icky, you know, like there was this sort of post post nationalist feeling where we're all global citizens. And um, why would we, you know, work with these petty things of like killing people and fighting and, and, you know, so I think it was really a time where the U S was had won the cold war pretty dominant and it just didn't feel like the threats were existential. I think that's all quickly coming to an end. Um, I predicted this several years ago, I have to say, but I do think that, um, we're starting to see a re-blending of almost all tech is becoming consumer, you know, business and national security related. And so I, what I think Leopold and Aschenbrenner is pointing out is that um, it's going to be super important that national security almost really drive AI and at least create the, the boundaries around it. And I think what he's saying is a couple of things. First, Competition with China will drive this, right? China has certain advantages. We need to get more serious about it very quickly. And I also believe that he thinks a lot of the problems are solvable. So I kind of go through each of those in turn. Um, so one thing he's, and, and then the other thing is that AI is advancing at an accelerating pace. And he, you know, he goes through 
I think he, I don't know if he pronounces it ooms or OOMs, but uh, orders of magnitude changes. And so if you just look at like what happened between GPT-2 and 4, it's incredible amount of development, right? Where it went from like not able to barely string a sentence together to doing high school level work and passing, you know, AP exams. So I think we have to think that um, as we go to five, you know, GPT-5, 6, there are other models obviously as well um claude and and uh mr all and others then we're going to see huge orders of magnitude changes and i think he i don't know he doesn't really call it i guess he does call it agi but he he talks about an intelligence explosion essentially where once you get llms or ais that are as smart as an ai researcher currently so somebody is at harvard researching you know someone who's like playable conceivably will be able to create bots, AIs, agents that can do the research itself, then all of a sudden exponential explosion in intelligence, right? Because the researchers can do their own research and they, and we don't need to train hundreds of thousands of people, you know, or right now it's probably hundreds to thousands who actually know how to do that and push the research forward, right? You can have these agents just working full time when basically constrained only by um, the amount of compute they have. So I think he sees, he foresees in the next, I don't know, he really calls in the next four years, I think, or maybe 2027, uh, 2028, like really like potentially reaching this goal where we would have AIs that were intelligent enough to become AI researchers. So then you see this intelligence explosion and whoever gets there first, obviously is going to have a huge advantage because even a few months ahead, you're going to, once you get this explosion, even a few months will put you really far ahead. I also think he thinks that um, some of our traditional deterrents won't work after that point. So these programs could get so smart that they could go in and disable nuclear weapons. They could, um, you know, they can start doing stuff that's so super intelligent that we wouldn't even know what was happening. So it's really crucial that be in the hands of the right people. And so then that leads him to say, look, that has to be the West. It has to be the United States. It has to be the West. We can't allow that to happen. And China being the, the leading contender, um, we can't allow an authoritarian system to get that uh, level of technology for us. And I 100% agree. I just think this is the reality of what, you know, that we've gone past this day and age when you know, oh, everything should be open, open science. And he tells a good story about one of the people in the Manhattan Project wanting to publish open research, how the fact that he was talked out of publishing some data actually put the German, the Nazi program on nuclear weapons, ended up, they ended up taking a wrong turn on one of the materials they were using, heavy water versus graphite or something. And uh, basically that put them way behind. So we need to start thinking this way, like the government is going to take a leading role in AI and that's just inevitable. The thing is too powerful and the potentials are, the economic potential is wedded to that national security potential and there's just no way that they're going to be separated. And I think you saw the beginning of this with just TikTok, you know, becoming an issue, right? So social networks were totally not part of the national security conversation for a long time. It started you know, during the elections, that was became an issue and but it really kind of a sideline. And but with TikTok, I think it's really gotten it's really shown us that consumer and national security technologies are are becoming indistinguishable. And now with AI, just the capability of it, it's gonna transform, you know, how we do business, how we, you know, consume media, how we do all these different how we get entertainment, but it's also, you know, it's gonna change how we fight wars. And and so there's just no way to cleanly separate those two things. So I think, you know, what I, I would go one step past him and say the distinction between consumer and national security technologies is being erased. Um, and so the Valley is going to become a pro-American, pro-Western place first. Pro-American first, pro-Western second. And if it isn't, they're going to get defunded and they're going to have huge problems with the national security establishment and the state. And I think we're going to legislate against that. And we, I think we have to, we have no choice. So that leads next to his uh, other conclusion I thought was really important. is just like the security 
we we have a bunch of little um, Manhattan projects going on and startups all over the co- the country I and mean, a lot of them in the Valley, all over the world, also in London and Paris and other places and all over China, obviously, too. We're allowing a bunch of startups to run around developing technology that could be potentially dangerous. Now, I think to some extent, we have to let that happen. It's fine. We need to be careful of not squashing innovation right away. But his point is that basically all of those labs, including Google's and Microsoft's and most startups are completely penetrated and infiltrated by at least the PRC, the Chinese government, and probably other actors as well, Russia, North Korea. So I think we have to be really clear <laughs> that um, they are going to steal everything that isn't bolted down. And it's pretty easy once you steal the um, weights and other things in, you know, an AI to just basically rebuild it. And I think the levels of security that we're talking about um, are just really pretty poor. Even the highest corporate security probably doesn't compare. Um, The reality is in the end, I don't think there's any, and I think Leopold says this, there's probably no way that we can stop China, North Korea from getting, stealing these secrets long-term. I mean, look, running an open society, if we're not going to live in police states like they do, um, it's going to be pretty hard to stop it. But we can slow it down and we can hobble it a bit. And the other thing is on the open source side, we're actually just handing it out, right? So that's that's got to be something that's addressed. I don't know if I'm 100% on board with saying, hey, no open source anymore on this stuff. How you define that? I think it's going to be a lot that's going to be a huge debate. And I don't know if I've settled on what I think, but certainly I understand the issue and we've got to get pretty serious. And I mean, he's talking about, you know, like, look, the most advanced research is going to need to be done in SCIF's secure departmentalized information facilities and, you know, with air gapped and like, you don't bring in, you check in your phone, you don't bring in anything that can be a recording device or anything that can, you know, be plugged into the USB of a computer and blah, blah, blah. Right. So very military levels of of security. Um, And I think we're going to see a merging of our, you know, that national security apparatus with the main labs that OpenAI, Microsoft and Google. And I think a lot of people think that's crazy. And I'm just telling you it's 100% going to happen because it has to. There's just no way we're going to sit there and allow them to continue doing this with like poor security protocols, like potentially selling some of it, you know, selling services to the Chinese potentially or others. This is just going to become too important a national security issue. So I think, you know, we're not going to see it this year, but we're going to see it soon. And I think the government is going to realize, our government's realizing the importance of this. You're already hearing Trump talk about AI. And I think Biden likewise would be interested in it. And they're going to start pumping massive amounts of money into it from the federal government. And that's going to come with the strictures as well and the security. And I think we can all say, hey, we can say it sucks to have government regulation of this stuff because it's going to slow it down in a lot of ways. And I totally agree, but I just think it's inevitable. The The competition is too fierce and the, the amount of advantage and power that if we get it before the Chinese or vice versa is just too big at stakes. So I think it's inevitable. The other thing is, I think he, you know, so what you could say out of all that is like, look, this sounds pretty scary. Why are we doing this? Why don't we just work with the Chinese and shut this crap down, right? And just stop it because it could really get out of control. And I think it's a fair point. But, um, and I think you see somebody like V Moskowitz, you know, saying something similar to that. I do think, you know, he worked, Leopold worked on super alignment. He has a long part of the, of the book or blogs that, focus on super alignment. Um, and he makes several points that he thinks is a solvable problem. It's not going to be easy. And particularly you get into this, you get into this problem where once the AI gets to this level where it has alignment researchers that are AI bots, how do you actually know that they're doing what they tell you they're doing? Like, can't they lie? Can't they, you know, the, can't they have other motivations that you don't understand? And he suggests a series of things that we can do. Like right now we're doing this, you know, what we really do with AI is is the companies do reinforcement learning from human feedback, the RLHF. Um, And that's when they're using the AI and then saying, no, that answer wasn't good. You know, that's why Google did all the crazy stuff with, with their model. 
and sometimes it's ridiculous, right? You can't get answers on silly things, but um, it is an important part of making, aligning the AI and making sure it's doing what it's supposed to. But that's really going to get to the point where like humans aren't going to be able to do that um, anymore. And uh, you're going to have like the scale and change of, of the model happening so quickly. So he talks a lot about, you know, what, what we can do to build rules and, and, purposes into the AI research bots and, and helping them putting in stuff that is constraints on the system, right? That it can't do. That part of it is good. It goes pretty deep into a lot of different things that we could do to achieve super alignment. And uh, he really feels, and like the guy works on it, you know, that was basically his career. I do think that it's a high risk area, but I think what he kind of comes to the conclusion is that we can kind of muddle through um, and get to a place where we can make sure that the the models are doing what we want to do. And he makes some points like it's easier to like evaluate what a model's doing than it is to actually generate the content, right? So seeing the output and analyzing it and making sure it's right, you know, making sure it's doing good things is easier than actually being the AI and creating it. He thinks we can scale the oversight of these AIs um, with our own AIs. I do think he feels like there's like a generalization property. So basically feeling like even if we can't understand everything the AI is doing, as long as the stuff that we do understand works and seems to be right for us, then it's probably the case that the AI is using those principles across. Doesn't make me feel warm and fuzzy, but there is something to that. And then he has a whole bunch of stuff around experiments going on, you know, because a lot of times people feel like, AI, well, they are basically black boxes. Like how do the connections get made as it learned? We don't 100% know. But he feels like there's a lot of advancements happening in this, inter they call it interpretability um, field that would allow us to actually understand how the AI is getting results. And that way we could we could trace it back and understand are there like flaws in it. I would suggest if you're interested in that reading through it, because there's a long part on that. And then, you know, like we can create all sorts of other AIs to monitor the AIs, that kind of thing. And there's a whole discussion around that. So I think the reality is this stuff is coming. And so we got to work hard on, on super alignment and um, we really don't have any other choice. Um, so he really feels like we need to take on like a national project to advance AI, use it for the means that you know, that promote U.S. and Western interests. And hopefully those also benefit humanity, right? Um, but also working on the super alignment. So like at least us, we can do some amount of work to make sure it's responsibly done. Um, if we allow it to go to others or third parties or non-state actors even, like they're, they might not have those same strictures. So it's better for us to do it than others. And there are some thinkers, you know, who who think that maybe this approach isn't the right thing to take on a national project. Because really what it does is it alerts the Chinese to the strength of, you know, how important we think this technology is. And maybe they start taking more resources away from overproducing electronic vehicles to working on AIs. And, um, you know, I think that's a real threat. I mean, that is a point, a good point is like by prioritizing our, ourselves, are we making them prioritize it? And we'd be a bit better off just letting it quietly grow in labs, you know, and in, in universities and and um, really in private companies at this point, kind of like unmentioned, you know, maybe we do a little bit of stuff around the sides, but we don't really draw a lot of attention to it to try to deprioritize it. And we probably got to lead that way because we have more leading companies and universities and talent working on it than the Chinese do. I think that's a fair point. I mean, I think if we thought that that was sustainable, that might be a way to go. But I just feel like given the power of this technology, we're going to quickly see it could even be non-state actors coming out and making big advances. And that's just going to scare everybody into getting involved. And so I think the sooner we get started, even if we just get a few months a year or two ahead of everyone else, all the better. If we can hit that super intelligence before anyone else, we've got to try it, I think, because someone's going to do it. The other thing I think uh, Leopold points out that that we need to be really conscious of is, while I do feel that the U.S. is in good position and the West in general with 
I, I think we have more people at the cutting edge of this and our companies have gotten there faster and they're more focused on it and more capital has been pushed to it. And I do think, you know, we do have this chance of a lead. I do think there's some serious weaknesses that he points out, like China's ability to mass produce low-end semiconductors. So yeah, they can't do the most advanced stuff, but they can brute force it with a lot of like lower end stuff. Two, that requires, and, and using the most advanced ships requires a ton of power. And I've talked about this before on the podcast about how Jensen Wang at, um, at uh, NVIDIA has said that the constraint might not be these chips that NVIDIA makes, you know, or designs and the GPUs. It might really actually be the power needed to power the data centers that use them. And we, we have had our power grid has been going through transformation, but it's basically been, you know, producing the same amount of power with a small increase every year. We haven't had real exponential increases in electric. We haven't needed it really, but they're talking about AI uses coming to 25 to 30% of generation, electricity generation very soon. And we have this sclerotic, you know, <laughs> regulatory system where we can't build anything. You know, the Chinese can mass produce electrical power and we've seen it. They've, their production has gone exponential in the last five to 10 years. He has a good graph in the, in the paper on it. And ours has just been kind of creeping. And so like, you know, it's possible they could beat us just by brute forcing the power. And like, are we, we better damn well get our act together to deal with that as soon as possible. And that's why I don't think we can just sit back and hope that they don't take notice of this and put more resources into it because our ability to respond, you know, building physical infrastructure is going to, it's going to take years and we need to get really serious about it now. And that requires permit reform, reform, it requires some federal intervention into the state and local processes. And I think that's going to happen because um, when, you know, we saw the same thing, like during the Cold War with the Soviets, when we needed to get serious and actually do the things that we needed to do, like create the internet and computers and blah, blah, blah. We brute force it and made it happen. And I think we're going to, we're going to do the same thing in this case. So Anyway, this has been um, like reading this and some of the thinking I've been doing recently just really took away how important AI is going to be, how this is just beginning. We're not even really understanding. I don't think Silicon Valley truly understands the level of government interest and intervention that they're going to be subject to. Um, and I think Leopold's just kind of pointing out hey, this is where we're going. This is pretty much what's going to happen. And I think, you know, our policymakers, our leaders of our companies are going to need to start understanding and shifting the way they think. And we're going to see increases in security, increases in federal investment. We're going to see, you know, we've got to look at these things like super alignment and our power grid. And we start got to start getting serious about a full AI strategy. We just don't have the time to wait. And uh, we'll hopefully... In the next administration, that's going to be a huge priority. So anyway, hopefully that was helpful to you. Definitely check out Leopold's work at uh, situational-awareness.ai. We'll we'll put it in the show notes. Um, it's a great read. I think something really apropos for the time. So have a good one. AI, government, and the future is brought to you by Corner Alliance. To find out more about Corner Alliance and how we work with government to create results, visit our website at corneralliance.com and then make sure to search for AI Government Future in Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Google Podcasts or anywhere else podcasts are found and click subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Corner Alliance, thanks for listening.